read a request. Unfortunately, it's a poem about a graveyard. <laughs> um, but, an unusual. I was um, teaching in a college in the black country, and the deputy principal, a lovely elderly lady of booming type, <laughs> came in and said, I've just been looking at the burning graves at Netherton. That, she said, would make a title for one of your poems. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't know what my poems were like. She didn't know they were already about graveyards. <laughs> but I thought, her. Huh. And for several years, thought, one day, I can't help it. I'll have to try to write. And I've been to see this phenomenon, which is quite interesting. Uh, Netherton is an old steel-making uh, former village in the black country among hills. Its parish church stands bonk just on top of the hill. It's a landmark for miles around. And uh, the faithful and the dead, as it were, of Netherton had been buried in the surrounding graveyard, <coughs> which was over an old coal seam, it being a mining area. The coal seam had caught fire and up right through the hill. And it's, um, anyway, this is described. And um, as you can imagine, it makes you think. <laughs> uh, sorry about that part of it. Enjoy the description. <laughs> the burning graves at Netherton. This is a hill that holds the church up. This is a hill that burned part of itself away. Down in the coal measures a slow smoulder, breaking out idly at last, high on the slope, in patches among the churchyard avenues. Netherton Church lifts up out of the falling land below Dudley. On its clean promontory, you see it from far off, not burning. The fire never raged, nor did the graves flame even by night, the old black country vision of hell furnaces. A lazy desiccation. The soil first parched, turned into sand, buckled and sagged and split. In places it would gape a bit, with soot where the smoke came curling out. And the gravestones keeled, slid out of line, lifted a corner, lost a slab, surrendered their design, caved in. They hung their grasses down into the smoke. Strange graves in any case, some of them edged with brick, even with glazed white urinal brick, beveled at the corners. Glass covers askew on faded green and purple plastic diadems of flowers. Patches collapses, unsafe ground. No cataclysm, rather a loss of face, a great untidiness and shame. Silence, absence, fire. Over the hill in the lee, differently troubled, a small raw council estate grown old. Red brick, flaky, unpointed, the same green grass uncut before each house. Few people, some boarded windows, flat, cracked concrete roadways curving round, and a purpose built shop like a battered command post. All speaking that circumstance of prison or institution where food and excrement are close company. Concrete, glazed brick for limits, a wooded hill at its back, silence, absence, fire. Um, going further back into the past, uh, we have um, a fascination, I know people who like to ask impossible questions like, what's it to be human, or Jewish, or gay, or French, or whatever you like. 
Um, often home in on our lost cousins or neighbours, the Neanderthal people. And the more we find out about what they could or couldn't do, the more we play around and guess at the implications of this. And um, I was in conversation about this with a friend, and uh, thinking of all the things they apparently couldn't do. Um, being a person interested in dance, she said, well, they could have danced. <laughs> <laughs> no records of that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I made up this, this little um, conversation with oneself called Dancing Neanderthal. It's a sort of circular self chat. Dancing Neanderthal. Stronger muscles than ours, sharper tools, could speak, possibly, write, didn't, unless with sharp stones they incised their skins that would die with them, observing the ban on lasting records. Traffic in symbols, paint on rocks, couldn't, didn't, may have been foresight and hard taboo to stop themselves inventing religion or football, or flags. <laughs> Our world's ways of life keep strong by prohibitions, and they may just have been better than us at that, as they no doubt were at contemplating extinction. They could have danced all night with that much muscle. <laughs> Sun, no reason why not. Hardwired to diatonic, and that's where I gave up. <laughs> um, just a couple more. All right, I'll sling a tricky one at you. It was so good and so here. Um, I had a title that I wanted to write a poem to. Um, I wanted it to be the title of this book, but the publisher wouldn't have it. Um, and the title I had in mind was the Wellington on the Wellingtonias at Pileth, which I thought was a lovely title. Yeah. <laughs> but um, to explain it, uh, but not too much, um, the Battle of Pileth, just on the borders of Radnorshire, um, is a place where the rebellious but somewhat dishevelled, purposeless army of Owain Clindur. Uh, apparently defeated an English correctional force. You know the sort of force I'm talking about. And um, <laughs> slaughtered them in a way gorily celebrated in Shakespeare's Henry IV with um, mutilations and cannibalism and God knows what. And uh, anyway, Pilith is there, it's a pleasant looking place. And somebody in the 19th century, I don't know who or why, thought we do have to celebrate places and planted a row of the suddenly newly fashionable Wellingtonians, you know, giant redwoods. And they look terrific. But just what the act of commemoration is, I don't know. Uh, the poem is a collection of all sorts of things where people have been impressed, including me as a small child, by something that's lifted up and high. Uh, it's a pictorial poem, I'm afraid. Um, you know what I mean? And uh, on the Wellingtonians at Pilleth, and it moves from uh, snapshots or bits of movie uh, from Canadian Indians dancing and being gods in the boats to um, you know, apparitions of the Blessed Virgin in strange places, um, impressing people. Um, hey, here we go. And I will end with this. In a long canoe sunk to the gunwales, to dance on a board as on the choppy water, the tall sea eagle in feathered trousers, and the raven, plumed arm wings waving, beaks agape, salmon and bear stamping, sore teeth snapping at the sky, all with heads thrown back, wild eyes taking in nothing, four gods making common cause of the people. Moreover, 
beings of what seemed flesh would lately float on gables or arrange themselves on a wall, supported by chi in the clear air under them that showed the hillside beyond it, their burning gaze to rain down still while they faded. Driving down off axe edge, on the hot afternoon of the day that would end with the full moon hung on the horizon as twice its size, rounding a familiar bend, and both of us seeing differently the anomaly ahead, tall brown figure in the limestone landscape, reared on a crag to command the desolate stuck car track, a quarry in the valley of the dove, eyeless, dynamic, brutal, maybe a puppet sculpture giant in rusted sheet metal, another expensive mistake, passed by the threat, and it goes back nearer nature, the three old horses that always amble in the boggy roadside fields have crisscrossed the bluff, growing bigger all the while. They've arranged themselves on the naked steps of the summit and stand there asleep as a single conjoined thing against the sky, waiting for the enormous moon to land and take them up. Stone horn shapes above a peaceful enough gateway and in the high great chamber a plaster frieze where beasts and tall women walk by among the trees in the woodland above it all. There are parts for kings, brown old thigh bones, shin bones, jaws, promiscuous teeth packed out of reach in their own air on high stone rails ready in their chests to travel. Odours of shellfish and salmon rising from marble counters in the pomp of the market defer to the palms raised above. Mask in the aquarium tank, breasting the view, floor up to roof where the skirts swish through the murk and sharks ride up and pass. Sunday 6.30, the Reverend Handel Broadbent, if I be lifted up, indeed, if so he be, the foot and fall of a late firework, where the lug between its alders wriggles and whines, fed once for a season or two with the leached out seepage driven down by the rain out of hundreds of corpses, somewhere Pilleth's ghostly church squats on the dead, others across the cropped slope of blown glass buffered now with alien fur. The four Wellingtonias planted low down late and pictorially, as if hoping to settle the matter, stretching their single dark plumes towards the ridge, stop at the sight line along the valley and make us a view. Thank you.